All right, Bree, should I begin? Give it one minute, people are still joining. Okay. Okay, feel free to start. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our June virtual board meeting. My name is Rick Cruz and I'm chair of the DC Public Charter School Board. Joining me this, joining me this evening are our um, other board members, our Vice Chair Saba Bereda, Steve Bumbau, Naomi Shelton, Leah Crusi, Jim Sandman, and Ricarda Ganjam. Before we get to our agenda this evening, I'd like to talk a bit about the unprecedented nature of the last three months and the impact on families across the city and the work that we've been doing at the DC Public Charter School Board. First, the public health crisis precipitated by COVID continues to affect education across the city. As we've begun to move into phase two of DC's reopening plan, DC PCSB and public charter schools are working with DC Health the department, uh, de the deputy mayor for education, ASI, DCPS, teachers, staff, and most importantly, families to determine what school will look like in the fall. We support the work of the DME to have schools align on schedules as, as they are able. This is a time in our city for everyone to work together as much as possible. And as I've said many times recently, the coordination across education agencies in responding to COVID has been impressive and commendable and a testament to the various leaders and their teams. At the same time, as schools reopen, we must recognize that each school has unique considerations, different facilities and staff constraints, different family preferences, and different pedagogical philosophies. And schools face tremendous uncertainties. Health guidance continues to, uh, to evolve. The city remains non-committal on the provision of personal protective equipment and accountability planning is still in process. We've already heard that some public charter schools are electing to be 100% virtual at the start of school in August. While 100% virtual may work for some, for others it may exacerbate challenges such as difficulty accessing online material, connectivity, or lack of custodial care. We hope that most schools don't choose this route and that those that do find a way to incorporate in-person learning at the earliest opportunity. Our goal is to make sure that every child receives a quality education with as little risk to their health and their family's health as possible. And we look to schools to reduce and remove any barriers to learning. Second, I wanna re reaffirm that we believe that Black Lives Matter. Our community, our city, and our country are in pain as the DC Public Charter School Board, we're committed to ensuring our schools welcome and serve all learners. As a, as a board, we are also committed to having an ongoing dialogue and examining our practices through an equity and anti-racist lens for DC students, their families, our schools, our communities, and our city. We'll continue our journey by better understanding the impact that institutional and systemic racism has on our community and the Washington DC public education sector we will hold ourselves accountable to these commitments. Third, and many of you have, may have seen, we've hired an outstanding education leader, Dr. Michelle Walker Davis, as the new executive director of DC Public Charter School Board. Dr. Walker Davis will replace Scott Pearson, who served as our executive director for over eight years. We look forward to introducing you to her when she joins us this summer. In the meantime, you can find more information about her at dcpcsb.org backslash executive director search. Fourth, we encourage every family to enroll their students as soon as possible in a public school, whether that be a, a public charter school or DCPS. When students enroll, it helps schools plan for the upcoming year, allowing them to better serve students. 
Families also benefit from knowing with certainty that their child is enrolled in a school for, for the next year. Finally, I'd like to congratulate the class of 2020. Although their traditional graduations were remote, some schools showed their ingenuity. One rented a drive-in movie theater to host a drive-in graduation. Another participated with LeBron James's NBA Graduate Together television broadcast on May 16th. And many others held, held virtual ceremonies as a way to bring their school community together. I got a chance to record videos for several of those and I was pleased to confer diplomas virtually. Uh, thank you. Uh, I anticipate we'll have more updates and information about school reopenings at our July meeting and as we get deeper into the summer. But now I want to move on to the business of today's meeting. There'll be a video for optional video for board members and for presenters for tonight's meeting. And as we move through each agenda item, Briani, our moderator for the evening, will unmute DC PCSB staff or individuals speaking on behalf of a school. The hand raising feature has been disabled. Individuals who've previously signed up to testify will be called upon. And as a reminder, all written public comment is available to the public on our website. If you didn't sign up by sending your name to Briani before this meeting, please submit your comments to public.comment at dcpcsb.org or call our public comment line to leave a voicemail, uh, voicemail testimony at 202-963-0949. Now, I'm going to begin uh, by inviting witnesses uh, who signed up to speak to provide their testimony. We have three members of the public who signed up for comments. Please keep your comments to two minutes each. I'm going to invite Candace Davis as our first uh, member of the public to testify this evening. Candace, you're on. Good evening. This is Candace Davis, and I'm a former vice principal from Ingenuity Prep. This is an update to our most recent efforts to protect the students and families at IP. IP's board chair, Peter Winnick, invited us to meet with IP's executive team to hear about their plans for next school year with hopes to satisfy our requests and resolve our concerns. After about 10 minutes of listening to the executive team, we quickly realized that no real improvements have been implemented at IP. We found issues with not only their lack of solutions, but also their disturbing comments, which confirms the lack of care for the lives of at-risk students. CEO Will Stesser claimed that their inclusion model was a learning opportunity as if he's not responsible for re researching best practices, as if we did not report concerns with a plan for corrective action in September, as if our students are test dummies and did not deserve swift and immediate solutions to an obvious problem. When we expressed concern about underqualified staff serving an at-risk community with high needs, Will Stetzer stated that they are not required to have certified staff, ignoring the difference between certified and qualified. When we asked about the hiring process, Chief of Staff LaShondra Thornton, someone with no education background, provided a generic response with no specific details related to the needs of our students. When we asked about resources and training for special education staff members, CAO Jennifer Tanton stumbled around random ideas. When we asked about systems for behavior management, restorative practices, and mental health support, no one could provide a plan. Will Stetzer disagreed with the need for school systems. Peter Winnick stated that our conversation about student needs was below his pay grade as if our jobs were beneath him. In an effort to attempt, in an, in an attempt to avoid responsibility, Jennifer Hampton summed up summed up our traumatic experience in witnessing complete chaos at IP as a perspective rather than actual fact. And Peter Winnick suggested that we just quote sit back and see what happens next year as if our students' lives have no value. Overall, the leaders at IP confirmed that their only plan was to have no plan at all. It was made clear that they will do the bare minimum at best because current laws protect them as business owners more than they protect the basic human rights of at-risk black students. Peter Winnick recorded this meeting and I'm sure he is willing to share it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Um, now I'd like to invite Ayanna Belguda. Ayanna, you're on. Okay, good evening. This is Ayanna Belguda, and I'm a former vice principal from Ingenuity Prep. After advocating for over nine months, we have given IP an extensive amount of time to correct violations. We compromise the well-being of students to follow your system of accountability. As a result, 35 staff members separated from the school by March. Students continue to experience trauma due to school's toxic and unstable environment, and they lost an entire year of instruction. At this point, we are no longer asking for proof of resolution because we know it does not exist. 
Instead, we are asking that you close in junior prep immediately for the following reasons. Our students have been traumatized by the negligence of IT, and they need a fresh start with a new environment, new leaders who are willing to go above and beyond to meet their needs. Since IT has been found guilty of several violations and they continue to violate the law, they should no longer be treated as innocent, as they should, and there should be real consequences for educational neglect. There is an overwhelmingly high rate of underqualified leaders, teachers, and staff at IT, which guarantees another failed school year. Uh, CEO Will Setzer has created a culture of fear, which means which means he will continue to get away with malpractice next school year because teachers would rather resign than, than get fired for speaking up. Those who stay cannot afford to leave their overpaid salaries or they choose to support the only system they know. The historical high turnover rate at the school is detrimental to the school's culture and climate, which directly impacts students' academic, social, and emotional stability. While we know parents may fight to keep the school open, we also know they were never given a real choice in the first place. So we are confident that they will see the benefits of leaving in due time. With that in mind, IT parents and families need a sufficient amount of time to research to search for a new school so students have an opportunity for a smooth transition. We know that parent voice is highly encouraged, but since IT's executive team has been successful with manipulation and deception. We are exercising our rights as educators. We all have a responsibility to protect and serve students, so we are asking that you respect our role as former vice principals of IP and advocates for black children in at-risk communities. Furthermore, if there are no policies that, pre that prevent you from closing in Juni Prep today, we are advocating to amend those policies immediately so students' lives can come before business. Thank you. Thank you. I know after our last uh, meeting and the last testimony of Ms. Belguda and Ms. Davis um, that the PCSB was um, engaging in some follow-up steps. Uh, Rashida uh, or Briani, could I ask you to um, admit Rashida Young to uh, the teleconference or the webinar? And Rashida, if you could give us an update from your end. Yes. We can hear you. And now we can. Yes. There, um, there. I, yes. Thank you, Rick. I uh, I just wanted to provide an update on our end. Um, I am aware that uh, the uh, Miss Serena Hayes, our DC's uh, DC's Ombudsman for Education, has um, spoken with Miss Candice Davis and Miss Ayanna Belguda earlier earlier this month, and that was something that we had encouraged because um, it it had appeared that conversations had broken down um, between uh, both of them and the school leaders. And I'm told that the ombudsman has reached out to the school to schedule a conversation, which would be more of a mediation, which is the ombudsman's role. Um, and it's not something that PCSB generally um, would facilitate on our own. So it is our hope that that mediation would yield better results. Um, the school, I understand, also had a meeting um, as they shared and the, the reflections from the school, um, I, I believe that those conversations do need to continue happening. So I'm just encouraging Ms. Davis and Ms. Belguda to continue those conversations and to, to um, consider having the mediation as we originally spoke of last month uh, because the, we don't want a meeting that um, they just described as non-productive to be the end of this conversation. Um, we are also continuing to follow up with OSI uh, that uh, OSI has purview over the state complaints um, that they've raised in the past. And I bring that up to say that, you know, our role has shifted over the past couple months and we're trying to stay in contact with the different entities that are engaging with uh, Ms. Davis and Ms. Belguda. Um, and at the same time, can, in encouraging them to keep an open mind and keep those conversations going until we come to a resolution. I realize that's probably not the answer they're looking for tonight, um, but we are just trying to keep those conversations going and keep everyone engaged so all parties can feel like there's a resolution. Um, we have not heard from families uh, recently in recent weeks and we are certainly open to if there are other ingenuity prep families that have concerns um, but at this time as for the request they they just made at this meeting um, that's something that we would have to discuss offline 
Rashida, um, the ombudsman is, has also been in contact with the school as well? Yes, uh, the ombudsman's been in contact with the school and I believe the next step is to try to get all three groups um, to have a conversation. So uh, Ms. Belguda, Ms. Davis, the school leaders and the ombudsman to see if they can come to a resolution that has not been able to, uh, you know, obviously they have not been able to come to a resolution this year and this is a, a different avenue that we're hoping will yield uh, better results. Great, thank you, Rashida. All right. Um, at this time, I think we have one more uh, member of the public who is um, listed to testify this evening, Shanta Williams. Bree, is Ms. Williams on the line? She's not on. Okay. Um, well, I can come back at the top of the start of the public meeting in case she is on at that this that point. Um, I did also want to flag one note here that there is um, additional public commentary um, both related to and unrelated to Ingenuity Prep is available in the um, public comment page of our website so that um, anyone uh, that would like to see any other public comment that was not shared verbally this evening can find it um, there. All right, so if um, our public comment is closed for this part of the meeting, I will move us to Charter amendments up for public hearing. And I believe Melody Sampson will be um, introducing all of those charter amendments. Melody, you're on. Thank you. I am Melody Sampson, Senior Manager on the School Quality and Accountability Team. This is a public hearing to discuss Youth Build Public Charter Schools proposal to increase its enrollment ceiling. The school is seeking to enroll an additional 53 students raising its enrollment ceiling from 122 to 175 by school year 2021-22. The LEA asserts that just as past economic downturns have yielded increased enrollment in adult education programs, current economic conditions caused by COVID-19 have created need and demand for programs like Youth Build. Per DCPCSB's enrollment ceiling increase policy, the school missed one indicator because it was an outlier for exclusionary discipline, However, they meet other indicators uh, reported in the policy. A representative from the school is available to, tonight to discuss their proposal. Great, thank you, Melody. Uh, good evening, Public Charter School board members, staff, students, families, and members of the public. My name is Claire Liebert, and I serve as head of school of Youth Build DC PCS. I'm honored to be here this evening on behalf of our school. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak in support of our enrollment increase application and to tell you a little bit more about Youth Build DC. Youth Build is unique among adult public charter schools and high schools, both traditional and alternative, in Washington DC. It is the only school designed to help opportunity youth build math, literacy, and employment skills and earn a GED, now a DC high school diploma, while at the same time providing direct service to the community by repairing and renovating housing for DC's low-income residents. We are applying for this enrollment increase for several reasons. First, the COVID-19 crisis has created an immediate need and demand for programs like ours. As we all know, COVID-19 has had profound effects on our city and our world, sickening more than 2 million people in the United States, throwing millions out of work across the country, and leaving tens of thousands of DC residents unemployed. According to DOES reports, more than 117,000 DC residents filed for unemployment between March 13th and June 22nd. We also know that the pandemic disproportionately hurts workers and those trying to enter the workforce who are already vulnerable. Young workers, people of color, immigrants, gig workers, those who are underemployed and long-term unemployed, as well as those who work in sectors characterized by unpredictable and low-wage work. 9.2 million workers aged 16 to 24, for example, are employed in service sector establishments, which have been hugely impacted by the pandemic. This crisis has hit youth and low-income workers especially hard. Most of these workers perform tasks that simply cannot be done from home, making them much more vulnerable to job loss. Although there are a number of measures in place to ease the pain of unemployment, including stimulus payments and additional unemployment insurance, 
These measures are short-term and often not available to our most vulnerable youth and young adults, such as those who are undocumented. They will run out at the end of July. As Cambridge University researchers noted in an April 2020 working paper analyzing UK survey data, our findings suggest that the immediate impact of the coronavirus downturn on workers has been large and unequal, with younger workers and those at the bottom of the income distribution hit hardest. If not addressed quickly, these impacts could inflict long-term damage. So preventing this shock from scarring the employment progression of the younger generation and the less economically advantaged is of high importance to prevent per permanent damage to the economy and individual welfare. While this research is focused on the UK, we're seeing similar patterns here in the US. As an article in the April 29th edition of the New York, New York Times notes, for example, that hopes for a V-shaped recovery where the economy quickly bounces back have faded. With each month of unpaid bills and rock bottom sales, more businesses will go bankrupt or decide not to reopen. More workers will drift away from their employers, turning temporary layoffs into permanent job losses. Finally, a Measure of America report issued just a few days ago on June 10th warns of a decade undone noting that all of the progress made to increase youth outcomes and lower youth unemployment over the last decade could be undone. They explain the COVID-19 pandemic will cause youth disconnection rates to spike dramatically. We estimate that the number of disconnected youth will easily top 6 million and could swell to almost one quarter of all young people. With students physically disconnected from schools and unemployment, the highest it's been since the Great Depression, Young people with the fewest resources will be left even further behind their peers and face the highest barriers to reconnection. While it is clear that young people of all stripes will suffer, low-income people of color will be the hardest hit. With all that said, we also know that young people are resilient and will seek the opportunities available to them. It is unsurprising that historically, the demand for GEDs has increased substantially during economic downturns. During the last recession, for example, we saw GED testing increase by more than 55,000 tests across the country, climbing from 692,000 tests in 2007 to 748,000 tests in 2009, and not returning to pre-recession levels until 2011. All of this evidence points to a significant need and impending demand for programming like ours. YouthBuild is equipped and prepared to help these young people and the city through the crisis. We have developed a successful educational model for opportunity or disconnected youth, students age 16 to 24 who have dropped or aged out of school and are often unemployed. Our model, which draws on the nationally recognized youth build model, is designed to meet students where they are by providing them with personalized learning experiences that allow them to learn and master material at their own pace, work towards earning their GED, improve literacy, numeracy, and in some cases, English language and citizenship skills while they build career and post-secondary read readiness, develop work readiness skills, earning industry recognized construction certification, give back to the city by building housing for low-income residents, and build life skills to prepare them for success after completing the youth build program. Our results speak for themselves. We have earned a tier one rating on the PCSB's performance management framework for the past three years. Our charter was very happily just renewed for 15 years without conditions. And our GED completion rates, EL growth, and employment outcomes are among the highest in the adult public charter sector. In March, we transitioned promptly to virtual programming with very pro promising results. Students have been able to continue preparing for the GED, um, uh, make progress in numeracy and literacy, continue learning English language and technology skills, as well as some construction training through online curriculum modules. Students have also joined in one-on-one -on -one sessions with our case managers and transition specialists, participating in counseling, building social emotional skills, and preparing for post-secondary education and employment. Although more adult and alternative schools have opened in the city, none match our model, which combines personal learning, service learning, and an integrated education and training approach that enables students to earn a stipend while they attend school. There's a high need for programs like ours that effectively prepare disconnected and opportunity youth for success. Even in the best of times, demand for our school continues to exceed the number of openings we have for students. In the prior two school years, we received more than 350 applications each year for just 122 program slots. And we have served far more students than we are funded to serve, typically 150 to 160 over the course of the year. 
This increase would allow us to address this demand and help to ensure that both the needs of our students and our city are met. It would also allow more students to earn a stipend while they attend school. Right now, we are the smallest adult education program and our enrollment ceiling is the lowest in the adult education charter sector. Our current enrollment cap of 122 places severe constraints on the number of students we are able to serve and also on the ways in which we are able to meet the needs of our students in the city. This increase would enable us to fill increasing demand in the city for qualified and experienced construction workers. As the 2020 Wioa State Plan makes clear, construction is and continues to be a high demand field in the District of Columbia. Moreover, construction is considered essential work, allowing graduates to obtain employment even in this uncertain economy. While construction and infrastructure jobs are expected to continue to grow, they also provide essential entry points for disconnected youth since they offer a range of positions with widely varying skill and educational requirements that allow students multiple access points to employment and career growth. By improving this enrollment increase, PCSB would enable us to better meet the needs of our, the city and our youth. Currently, the district is under tremendous stress. Low-income residents are at greater risk than ever of losing access to stable and safe housing. And with the sharp economic downturn, nonprofit organizations that have historically provided housing are under tremendous pressure as well. YouthBuild has and is well positioned to meet this need. Over the course of the past three years, for example, YouthBuild students have worked with Brothers of Charity to completely renovate a transitional housing shelter for veterans, assisted with exterior repairs to a wind shelter, and most recently worked with Central Union Mission to make repairs and renovations throughout their main shelter in downtown DC. As letters from our partners explain, we provide crucial support to our students in our community. Sally Cox, CFO slash COO of Central Union Mission writes, as a youth build partner, we have personally seen the impacts that youth build DC has on the lives of young women and young men the school serves, as well as their neighbors and community members. As the year progressed, youth build students rose to the challenge of upholding high standards for professionalism as they shared space along time, alongside our shelter's guests and staff improving in timeliness, use of appropriate language, and conflict management. At the same time, youth build students and staff contributed substantially to creating a welcoming environment for our guests, refreshing all of our dormitories and common living areas with fresh paint and carpentry repairs. The construction skills they mastered during this process were simply amazing. We have close partnerships with construction firms through groups such as ACE Mentoring that also allow us to meet the city's needs. The combined experience of construction, service, and community development prepares students for the next steps in their lives. As I described earlier, we have envisioned a gradual increase in enrollment, growing from 122 to 150 next year, then to 175 students the following year. We have the capacity to serve many more students than we do currently, especially since our model involves both academic preparation and vocational on-site training. We are planning for a hybrid learning model next year that will combine distance, blended, and traditional classroom learning, and we can easily accommodate 28 additional students as part of this model. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, board members, I'll open it up for questions. <clears throat> yes, this is Jim Sandman. I have a question. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and especially for the data that you presented. I'm interested in what you're seeing currently uh, that might reflect increased demands, what your experience is with recent inquiries, where you stand in applications for the, for the coming year. What is your on the ground experience with anticipated demand for the coming school year? Sure, so like many schools across the adult education sector, we're finding it's off, enrollment's off to a little bit of a slower start as we're coming out of um, distance learning. Our population traditionally engages in person for enrollment, um, but we're, we're working through it. We're getting applications, um, we're updating marketing, we're in, really ramping up our social media and online presence um, to engage with folks when they're not there in person. Um, we, are hopeful and anticipate those numbers to continue to increase over the summer, especially as the city begins to open up more and more. Thank you. Hi, thank you uh, again for your presentation. Um, 
I echo the comments my colleague um, Jim made. So I just have a quick question about um, what you've seen with the students or the graduates that you've had. Like, what has their um, employment uh, been like over the last two years or so? Um, so, you know, how many of them have found employment in the construction industry? And any other information you can provide about um, how your graduates are faring in this current market? Sure, so I can give especially one, um, one case uh, of a recent graduate who, through that partnership with ACE Mentoring, you know, she participated not only on our construction site, but in sort of intensive um, mentoring with construction uh, experts across various fields, so plumbing and, and engineers and architects. And through that partnership, she was actually given an apprenticeship with Smooth Construction. Um, she's still employed there. She's phenomenal. Um, she actually comes back to continue assisting with the ACE mentoring program. Um, and so overall, I mean, she's a great example of one student who's really invested in construction, has, has thrived in that field. Um, overall, our, our employment numbers are strong. I mean, I think right now we're still, you know, kind of feeling out students and former students as they navigate the recession themselves. Um, but overall, the results have been positive. And when you say positive, do you have percentages as far as how many of the students or graduates have found employment in construction? And then now that we're in the pandemic, are they able to do virtual learning at all? So for virtual learning, yes. Um, certainly there are limits to virtual learning for construction. Um, however, HBI, our, um, the Home Builders Institute, through which our students earn certification, they very quickly opened up some online modules. So students are able to continue learning. However, of course, with construction, there are limits to what you can learn online. Certainly you cannot um, as easily demonstrate the ability to hang drywall uh, over a computer, but we're very excited and hopeful now that the city has entered phase two that we'll be able to demonstrate those skills and continue uh, completing certifications with students in the fall. Um, regarding our employment numbers, every year we have exceeded our employment targets, as you can see on our PMF scores. Um, and generally, you know, we use construction as a vehicle for um, overall employment and employability skills. Not all students go into construction after youth build, um, but that's okay. We're, we don't expect them all to. It's a means to re-engage in school, to support the community, and generally develop those um, soft skills as well, preparing them for almost any career. Uh, Claire, just following up on that, uh, you say not all go into construction. Would do most go into construction? Do is the is it fifty percent? Is it twenty percent? Is it is the student who you cited the only student who went into construction? I, I just can't get a sense of what the what the numbers are. Sure. So certainly not the majority of students go into construction. Um, they go more into other fields. They continue in hospitality. Um, they, sorry, um, they, sorry, they continue in hospitality. They, um, work in sales. They have a whole variety of, of careers. Again, construction for us is not the only means for them uh, in terms of employment and career after this. It's much more about overall employability skills and being able to be employed in any setting in any field. Um, I'll, I'll ask again, is it, is, is the student you cited the only student? Um, is it 10%? Is it 20%? I, we've now determined it's not 50%, but I still am not really getting a good sense of what the numbers are. I would say anywhere from 10 to 40% of students go into, or 10 to 20%, excuse me, uh, go into construction after youth build. Thank you.
Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about your disciplinary rates. Um, we've noticed that you are an outlier for disciplinary rates um, and that in 2018-19, uh, you suspended 15.6% of your students. So I wanted to better understand what are you doing to address your discipline rates? Absolutely. Yep. So I became interim head of school in November. Um, since the start of January, we haven't had a single out of school suspension. Um, I know that's a limited window through um, the school closure in March, um, but that was a huge pivot um, in my coming on into that position to much more inclusive disciplinary practices. Um, as I think I mentioned during our, our meeting in January about our renewal, we are very excited about beginning to implement more restorative practices at our school. After a many months long search, we have finally found an incredible candidate um, to lead that work at our school and they'll be joining our team in July. Um, and so that person is absolutely charged with leading our work to ensure students are present, that they are ready to learn, and that they're preparing uh, to succeed after youth build through all of these sort of soft skills that we've talked about and leading through those. Um, they're you know, well positioned, they have a great background in restorative circles, in responsive classrooms, and all of those great strategies. Um, I'll be working closely with them over this summer to revise our student handbook and, and all of these practices so that we can continue the progress we were making um, with the start of 2020. Thank you. And what do you attribute, I mean, from November through January timeframe, what, what were some of the strategies that you used and, and, and some of the challenges that you saw around discipline? Sure. So I partly it's, I'm a former educator myself. I, started out my teaching career at Blue. Um, I know very, very deeply the importance of building relationships with students. So I've invested a lot of time and, and energy in that. Part of the challenge too was the school needing to, to refine and, and reinforce its kind of regular structures and procedures, giving more um, routine and reliability to the day, which helps, you know, everyone feel calmer. They know what to, everyone, students and staff know what to expect, what's coming next, um, which helps kind of on the front end prevents a lot of uh, disciplinary issues. Um, I think too, we implemented new protocols for making decisions around discipline. So really taking a beat to take a breath, to talk, to walk through different options, and making sure we were hearing from everyone involved in a in an incident before moving forward with any kind of consequence. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is Naomi. Um, I have a question about your engagement with the community that you serve, and uh, both internal, both internal and external, um, as you were developing this proposal. Did you receive input? Did you uh, request input from that community, from those two different communities? And how did that input influence your plans? Sure. So um, we did reach out to our ANC commissioner. We have not heard back, unfortunately, on that front. Um, however, all of our community partners and our students and our staff are, are engaged in this process. Um, we're excited at the possibility of having more students um, as, as Sally Cox at Central Union Mission uh, mentioned, like she would love to have more students engaged in the work. Um, they were very excited about that, that partnership as well. And any, any input from uh, some of your graduates or current students on how, um, how you thought about developing and submitting this plan? Sure. So, I mean, in part, when I, when I took on the role as interim head of school um, mid-year, I engaged in a series of small focus groups with different groups of students to get a feel for what they're looking for in the school, what they're excited about, what they'd like to see change. And we also conducted um, a survey of any students who were not in those focus groups as well. 
Um, the sorts of programming that they're looking for we're very excited about, but would be better able to provide um, if we're able to grow a little bit more and have that, that flexibility. Thank you. I have a question, Ms. Lieber. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. First, thanks for all the great work Youth Build has been doing over the past 15 years. Um, you're talking about adding almost 50% more students. What kinds of changes are you making to the organization to accommodate for this kind of growth? Sure. So I think a big part of that, I mean, in my mind, one of the most exciting parts of that next year is again, this restorative practices coordinator. I think, you know, as Melody mentioned, one of the areas that we need to grow in is that school culture and discipline side. And this person will grow that workout so much um, and ensure that we have this strong, um, welcoming, encouraging, but also accountable school culture that we need not only to recruit and enroll new students, but maintain the engagement um, of, of current and former students as well. What are some of the issues youth builds facing on the, on the discipline front? I ask because I'm trying to, th I, I think somebody on the staff can correct me if I'm wrong, that we tend to see, uh, I think significantly lower rates of suspension at the adult schools. They tend to have highly motivated older students who are um, looking to, to become employable. Um, what, what's, what, what have the issues been at, at youth build in this regard? Sure. So our student population is a bit different uh, than perhaps Carlos Rosario's might be. Um, our students are rate right, 16 to 24. Some are actually still minors. Um, a fair number are coming to us from outside referrals, even from parole officers. Um, they've been, you know, court involved previously, they're trying to get back on their feet, um, or they've been out of school for a couple of years and trying to get back in uh, and finish up the work that they'd started uh, earlier in high school. So along that path, you know, if you've been out of school for a couple of years, that reentry process can be, can be bumpy. You know, there's, there's a time period for adjustment, um, responding to, to, to rules and expectations. Um, I think the, if we're looking back on some of our more serious incidents this year, some of it um, has been the interesting or challenging combination of, um, frankly, relationship violence that, that comes into the school. Um, those have, have certainly been challenging incidents and more, more frequent um, than we would hope for. We're, again, <laughs> the restorative practices coordinator is charged with really leading the work to support and prevent some of that. So doing some, you know, relationship and communication training with students as we look ahead. Um, in prior years, some of that might have been, you know, small fighting or things like that. Um, that has been less of an issue this year. Thank you. And then I Sorry, Rick, I have one last question. Um, how have you all seen the engagement with students now that you're in a virtual space? And then what do you anticipate the fall looking like for you all? Sure, so actually, um, we pivoted, like I mentioned, pretty quickly to distance learning. Um, we've averaged, uh, about, one sec, let me pull up my, my numbers. We've averaged a little bit shy of 40% of students engaging every week. Um, that number through a variety of strategies continued to increase um, throughout the, the distance learning period. So, Um, so students 
earned, I'm sorry, or participated in an average of about uh, 170 hours of live instruction uh, over the course of March 16th to June 12th. Uh, that number increased every week um, from March to about Memorial Day, and then we had a little bit of a bump. Um, but overall engagement was pretty strong. Um, students persisted through more than 60% of our students picked up Chromebooks uh, and continued to engage in instruction over that period. Thank you. Um, I, go ahead, Rick. No, no, no. Who's got it? Uh, Claire, I had a question about what we refer to as net mobility. So what we see at all of our adult schools is very high levels of attrition um, where you know adult students be they uh, opportunity youth or older students enroll but then you know their life takes over and they're not able to continue and so we typically see you know withdrawal rates throughout the year of 20 to 60 percent um, but we also see schools then re-enroll. So students leave and then maybe um, when the next semester begins, the schools re-enroll and fill the school back up. So that when we look at what we call net mobility, we find that you know, the schools lost a lot of students, but they brought a lot of new students in. And so net mobility might, might be actually positive. The school enrollment grew or it might only, the, the, the net might only be down by five or 10%. Um, but with youth build, the net mobility is closer to 30%. So for example, um, last year, the school started with 118 students, lost 50 students, but then only enrolled 15 back. Um, or the year before the school started with 122 students, lost 73 students, um, but only enrolled 39 back. And so uh, my question is, what, what explains the inability to re-enroll up to your full enrollment level? And should that be a flag for us that perhaps the school may have trouble filling its um, seats um, if we were to increase the school's enrollment ceiling? So I think rather than a, a a concern. It's been a strategic choice in, in prior years. It's much, it's been focused on sort of, you know, maintaining the structure, you know, when you bring new students in, it can, can add um, some not chaos, but it's more, you know, you have to have orientation happening at the same time as classes. And so in prior years, they've only done that a few times a year. Um, our program's also just a longer term program. It's not, you know, meant to be done in a, in a couple months. So we do keep students on longer. When we look ahead to next year though, we've been in talks as a leadership team about um, finding ways to maintain the structure and, and keep classroom programming very smooth with minimal interruption, but also do those re-enrollments more frequently, um, potentially as much as every month or every other month. Thank you. So I have a question, and maybe this will be our closing question, but it'll bring us back to where my colleague Jim started. Um, uh, so Claire, in, in lieu of enrollment data, which I understand is in short supply right now in terms of an indicator of demand, what are you and your board looking to to justify um, the need to grow at this particular moment in time? Sure, that's a fair question. I think. Um, it's more, we'd like the opportunity to try and grow, right? Um, as I've said, we're, we're a tier one school. We've been a tier one school for the past three years. Um, we're a good program. It's a great quality educational experience for students. And we do sincerely believe that, you know, once we get through some of this initial, um, the challenges of, of enrolling and recruiting during social distancing, that the demand for the school really is going to rise and we don't want to have to turn students away um, in those circumstances. But, but why the demand for this particular model? I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm stuck on that 
as I as I look to you know and, and opening you're, you're basically asking for a higher enrollment ceiling three two and a half months from now two months from now yes so part of that is that you know our students are provided with a stipend right there's an immediate um, economic benefit to students who participate in the program um, as well as all of the supports that we provide around um, not just you know construction and uh, certification but also what we call transition so job resume work job applications mock interviews all of that work to prepare them as quickly as possible um, for part and full-time employment okay um I've, i for one i'm still a little bit unsatisfied with the demand um uh analysis i i agree you you have met um many of our uh, requirements um uh, but I, I'm, I'm still struggling with 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 that last last piece of it. Um, are there any other questions from other board members? All right, Claire, thank you for joining us this evening. I believe this will be up, Melody, up for vote next month. Yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Next, we will hear from Friendship Public Charter School. They are requesting um, to offer competency-based learning units beginning in school year 2021 uh, to their ninth grade through 12th grade students who are enrolled in or complete courses at Friendship Collegiate Online Academy, which includes students who are enrolled at Friendship Collegiate and Friend Friendship Tech Prep High School. Um, given that Collegiate Online appeals to students who seek greater flexibility, for example, students who are duly enrolled, um, those who have internships and student athletes, the LEA believes the program will be of benefit by allowing students to advance in a course without the constraints of time. Representatives from the school are available this evening to answer the board's question. I think we've had several people, uh, <laughs> several people join from Friendship. So if um, you'd like to introduce yourselves, I don't know if someone is um, going to be the lead spokesperson and any opening remarks you have before uh, you entertain questions. Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Ken Cherry. I am the chief of staff with Friendship and I'll let the other members of the team introduce themselves as well. I'm Monique Miller, director of performance reporting and evaluation. Good evening, I'm Dr. Peggy Jones, the Principal of Friendship Collegiate Academy campus. Good evening, Kune Booth, Principal of Friendship Tech Prep Academy. Geneva Logan, Special Education uh, Coordinator, Friendship Collegiate Academy. Good evening, Lauren Johnson, Upper School Academy Director, as well as working with Ms. Miller on our Edmentum Online for Collegiate. Good evening, Rachel Roberts, Senior Director of Student Support Services from District Office in the Special Education and ELL and 504 um, programs come, come under my umbrella. And good evening, this is Vialka Scott Marcus and I'm the Chief Academic Officer at Friendship Public Charter School. Good evening, folks. My name is Andrew Scott Lobdell and I am actually with Edmentum, the partner for Friendship Charter. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Norwood. I'm the Director of Academy Professional Learning for the Partner Edmentum, and happy to be here tonight. And I think that might be everyone. <clears throat> so uh, I'll go ahead and uh, provide opening remarks. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about our request to offer competency-based units to students who take courses at our friendship Collegiate Online Academy. For over 20 years, Friendship Public Charter School has been committed to ensuring all students who attend a Friendship High School campus get to and through college. The first step in this process is graduating from a high school, uh, graduating with a high school diploma. Approval of this request supports this commitment and our mission. Friendship seeks to meet the needs of all students to ensure that they graduate in four, five, or even fewer years. Obviously, competency-based regulations were passed by the State Board of Education to allow schools the flexibility to meet the needs of all students. Often when we think of competency-based learning, 
we think of providing students the opportunity to understand course content at their own pace, usually meaning allowing for more time and alternate ways of demonstrating mastery. For the Friendship Collegiate Online Academy, we are seeking to shift this thinking to include instances in which students need less time to master standards. What is great about our online high school program is that it already allows students to work at their own pace and sometimes, when needed, give them the opportunity to demonstrate mastery in a different way. In this proposal, we are asking that the time element of acquiring hours be removed. There are students who need more time and there are students who, need, uh, who may need less time, depending on the subject and the unit of study. With your approval of this request, we can further meet the individual needs of students beyond how we meet them currently. Friendship shares your staff's conclusion that this shift will result in increased rates of course completion, which will contribute to higher graduation rates. Friendship will also ensure that all students, especially students with disabilities and ELL students, will not only have access to the programming, but also the support of our student support services team and ELL instructors. Whether it be for a job, the need to take a sibling or take care of a sibling or sports, there are many reasons why this amendment is important for you to support. Joining us this evening is Gabby Montgomery, whose child Robin Montgomery has been enrolled with Friendship for five years. Robin is a rising 11th grader at the Friendship Collegiate Online Academy, and Ms. Montgomery is here to share with you her experiences with the Academy and why approval of this request is needed. Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, Friendship Collegiate Online Academy, part of Friendship Collegiate Campus, is the primary reason my daughter is the number one girl on the college recruiting list for tennis as a rising junior. Without the partnership from the campus-based administrators, the teachers from Ed Options through Edmentum, and technology, Robin would not be able to do what she does. Over the past two years at the Collegiate Online Academy, Robin has always had access to teachers and resources. Robin communicates with her teachers via email, phone, and text. Due to her schedule, she misses the online Zoom help sessions. However, she receives the recordings of the lessons and then follows up with her teachers as needed. The teachers and administrators at Friendship are extremely responsive and are always there to help. Competency-based education provides students with individualized learning opportunities and creates more pathways to graduation. Competency-based learning will benefit Robin. She will be able to complete coursework at her pace and it, it will remove a level of stress trying to reach the seat hour requirement when she has already achieved academic mastery. Competency-based learning creates flexibility for students to have an individualized high school experience. When more time is needed to achieve mastery, the option is there, reinforcing character traits such as perseverance and persistence. When academic standards are achieved in a short amount of time, students have the opportunity to delve into a content area that they are more passionate about. We have to ask ourselves what matters. I believe that achieving specific academic standards is more important than meeting the time requirement. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'll open it up to my board members if anyone has any questions at this point. I have a question, Rick. Um, so for the friendship team, the case for competency-based learning has been made pretty, um, um, makes a lot of sense and it's been in the ether for you know the last decade or so. What is it about moving to a competency-based uh, instruction that has you nervous? What's the, what's the big challenge you think you face? There must, be, there must be somewhere you would have done this a long time ago. Um, this is Monique Miller speaking. I think that, um, well, when we first applied for um, the online academy back in 2018, we wanted to offer competency-based um, units as part of our program at that time. And that was also based on um, a boot camp that we had with a combination of Friendship Collegiate staff and teachers and students. 
as well as tech prep teachers and students, and even parents and students from our friendship um, online campus that serves grades K to eight. And we were very interested, I think, at the time, um, just in speaking with um, staff at PCSB, um, there, I guess there was concern about um, how it would be done. And so now that we've been engaged in this work for two years, um, going into our third, we've had an opportunity to um, work at the high school level, even though we've been you know, working with our K-8 campus for a number of years, um, we've been able to see how the students work. And so I think we're excited about the opportunity to offer this option to students. Um, we have heard from students where they are, um, you know, a little bored and, and, and staying engaged is sometimes challenging because they may have, ex have experienced um, content at our um, K-8 online school and they're coming into this environment. And so they're, you know, really, really working hard um, to stay engaged when they have to sometimes repeat content that they've been exposed to or um, have not had the opportunity to demonstrate what they know in advance. And so we have been um, not offering courses with pretests <clears throat> for students taking courses for the first time um, out of concern that if they tested out of many of the units, then they would not have um, they would not accumulate the requisite hours. And so um, instead of being afraid, I think we're really excited about um, what this could mean for our scholars, both who are full-time uh, enrolled students at Friendship Collegiate Online Academy, as well as our students who um, may be interested in, in taking singleton courses. Um, you know, um, in addition to what they're, they're studying in their brick and mortar um, schools. So, Ms. Miller, then the online academy has been something of a pilot for a broader expansion of uh, the competency-based instruction? Um, not really a pilot. It's, a, it's an academy that we think um, enhances our Friendship Collegiate um, Academy. Um, and we, you know, we believe that this was something that our families wanted and we wanted to be able to offer it to them. And with, um, and doing it in partnership with um, Collegiate with the supports and the extracurriculars that they have there, um, it, it just allows us to offer our students a much more robust um, programming. So all of our students who are a part of the Friendship Collegiate Online Academy have access to all of the extracurriculars, um, all of the opportunities in terms of um, college trips and things like that. So um, we, we see it as um, you know, an opportunity to be in an environment that is um, supportive of all scholars. And just adding on a little bit to what uh, Monique said, uh, you know, being able to offer this will allow other scholars who aren't enrolled full time in the online academy to take singleton classes um, and participate in adding to their current course uh, coursework uh, in their current schedule. So uh, again, not necessarily a pilot, but like I said, an opportunity for even others uh, outside of the online uh, academy to to earn additional credits uh, while also attending their brick and mortar classes. Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone for your presentation tonight and the responses so far. I'm, I'm curious how, if at all, would the model need to be adjusted if there's so much uncertainty right now, if it looks like in-person school is not going to happen in the fall and all learning will need to happen virtually? Um, this is Ms. Miller again. I'll start. Um, well, um, we've been we've been doing this um, with with our current um, full time online students, and so at the beginning of the year, students would come in twice a week, 
And we thought that that was important. Well, they actually started with the Summer Bridge program um, as ninth graders getting to know each other. And so they came um, every day. And then um, in the fall transitioned to twice a week. And then we transitioned that to once a week um, for, um, for those students who didn't need as much um, support transitioning to ninth grade because whether it's an online program or brick and mortar, our middle school students um, transitioning to ninth grade is, is, you know, sometimes it's a difficult transition. So we wanted to make sure that they um, acquired the study habits that were needed as a high school um, student. And so um, our, us coming together was about building that rapport. And so when we transitioned to um, you know, full-time um, virtual where we, where we weren't meeting, um, we actually meet more often um, in Zoom sessions. We communicate with our students more frequently than we did when we were meeting with them um, once a week and having those face-to-face those face-to-face um, -face meetings. And so now we have um, transitioned, we are, we are, uh, we began our um, Summer Bridge program uh, today, as a matter of fact. And so what will be important um, is meeting with our students frequently throughout this period of time to again build those relationships. Um, and I think that the more we communicate with parents and the students and they have an opportunity to meet with each other, that um, that will go a long way um, towards, um, you know, kind of alleviating, um, you know, just the challenges of being in a completely virtual um, environment. I, I just think that the communication and reaching out to parents will be very, 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 um, you know, critical. And hopefully, once we're able to return um, to school in some sort of um, capacity going, you know, as we're planning through going through the stages, um, whether, you know, it's an alternating day or whatever, we're, you know, just meeting in small groups to have that time to connect um, in person will be critical. But I think, you know, we're, we're doing it now. And we've, I think we've all learned that we just have to make sure that we're doing more check-ins with students, that we're talking to parents and that we, you know, and that parents and students feel that they um, have access to us. And our students don't meet in person with our online teachers, but I have to tell you that um, many of the teachers built great relationships with um, the students uh, over the course of the year because when we have um, live Zoom sessions or office hours, initially, um, I would meet with the students and, and the online teacher so that the students would feel comfortable um, communicating, um, you know, with, with the online teachers. But the online teachers are very, very persistent. Um, they ask parents and students their preferred method of communication, and they will communicate with families in that way. Um, and so, you know, we... Our, our students definitely have um, some favorite um, teachers, um, you know, because they engage often with them in face-to-face -face, um, sessions and one-on-ones even. And just adding on to um, what Monique said, um, I don't know if there would be a lot to change. I mean, when we think about our online students, whether they are K-8 to students or our high school, um, when, you know, buildings were closed due to uh, the recommendation by DC Health, our online students didn't miss a beat. Uh, their content is already online. Uh, their platform is already online. So when we think about the unreachable students and when we had to complete reports for that, um, it, it was very easy to say for our K-8 to as well as our high school academy that they were you know, zero. Everyone was reachable during that time. So uh, they really didn't miss a beat. I think the, the one new thing that we would have to prepare our, would be the, the preparation for the pretest. Uh, and making sure that as students sign up to take uh, new courses, that they would be allowed to um, uh, take the pretest, therefore chunking the curriculum and basing the uh, actual course around what the student needs to master, not all of the things that are, are common, or not all of the things that they have already mastered, but also need to learn as well. 
Thank you for this. It's just a follow up to clarify if there, if you anticipate that more, there may be more demand for this program, will you have to adjust resources so that there's adequate, there are enough teachers available, there's enough whatever available so that if there are more students that are interested in accessing this, um, they'd be able to. Well, we currently have an enrollment ceiling of 51, uh, 15. So uh, we know that we have the ability to take on more students. Um, I would also add that uh, th we currently use the teachers that are provided to us through their ed, ed options platform. So uh, they take on that responsibility of making sure that you know, students have access to teachers. Um, so like I said, we would be able to meet that demand. Currently, our, um, our online high school uh, is at 88% capacity uh, at this time with respect to registration. So we know that there's a demand and people are looking for this. So we've been working exclusively uh, with our partners at Edmentum to make sure uh, that we have all of the things uh, provided for them. We've already gone ahead and made sure that we have the necessary technology uh, as well as internet hotspots for uh, more students. So uh, to your point, uh, we'd be able to meet that demand. This is uh, Scott Lobdell. I'd like to just also add that the one thing that we'd like to do as a partner is, is stay in touch uh, with, uh, with, with Friendship Charter. Um, we, we generally have weekly meetings and uh, so we are always prepping for anything that um, that they actually would need. So if there was a need for more teachers, uh, that is something that we can actually bring on rather quickly. Ask about how um, this program would meet English learner needs. Um, can someone talk a little bit about how this looks for English le learners? So oh, good evening, um, this is Rachelle Roberts. So when we think about our L's, so the same structure that we have in our brick and mortar where we have a coordinator um, for our ELL uh, students. So if a kid was to come into the program, they would still have the home language survey. Um, that survey would then um, let us know if we needed to assess them um, and give them the WIDA assessment. And then an ELL plan, depending on how they test it, would be written for support. So not only would they um, participate in the core content of the um, online program, but they would also get the ELL support um, needed through an ELL teacher um, that we actually have within our network. This is Scott Lobdell again uh, with Edmentum. Um, the other, we have tools actually that are actually built into our curriculum uh, that will help those students and support them in, in their uh, the language that they speak um, naturally. Um, we we also allow because what's the what is the beautiful thing of online uh, learning is the fact that uh, students can pace at, at the pace that's most comfortable for them. And what we have found over the years, I've been actually doing virtual education for 20 years now, um, is that by allowing students to be able to learn at their own pace and also give them those support tools such as translation tools, um, as well as other supports like guided notes and, and such uh, with the help of our partner school, uh, Friendship, that that student is gonna be able to be well supported. And the way that we, in which we support our L's is also very similar to a way in which we support our uh, students with disabilities. So as Ms. Roberts also uh, noted, the, the plan that's, uh, that we develop for ELS is shared with our Edmentum teachers. Uh, they do make any modifications and accommodations um, for instruction. So when the student is participating in a whole group session or uh, in office hours with their teachers, they're able to do that. And as uh, noted too by Ms. Roberts, uh, when students need additional support, we would have that student, we would schedule that student to uh, visit one of our uh, classrooms, whether it be a collegiate or a community office where they could actually work with an ELL teacher uh, and support them uh, with implementing their ELL plan. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, since the Edmentum team is here, a follow-on question specific to supporting students with IEPs, could you speak to um, your organization's work with other partners on that particular priority area? Sure. Uh, we, in fact, it's um, what was amazing that we've learned over the years is the number of, of students uh, that we have um, worked with who have IEPs and 504s that uh, many school districts uh, around the country and um, now even the world um, are, are looking for answers for students who have those, those special needs. And that um, our team uh, is well trained um, in working with those students through both experience and also uh, the training that, that is provided for them through uh, our, our, our company. Um, uh, we also have, again, the, some of the same tools uh, that, that will help these students with, you know, both the concept of, again, the pacing situation, but also um, support tools, the guided notes I mentioned earlier, the, the, uh, the ability to um, increase size of text. Um, there, there's just a multitude of things that we can do um, as far as the software is concerned, but then I would add uh, the teacher part. Um, Kelly, would you would you want to speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. So I like to always think of it as it's really not no different of what we can do in a virtual environment versus what we can do in a physical brick and mortar, even if it's almost more specific and more personalized for the student. And so what's neat um, as a former classroom teacher of 15 years myself is that, you know, we always had that challenge of trying to differentiate and meet kids where they were at when we had a large class size and we had to get to a certain spot by a certain amount of time in order for, you know, testing or high stakes testing. And what's beautiful about the virtual environment and the flexibility is we have that more we have more freedom and time to meet with those kids and meet them where they're at and really get to know what their strengths and their weaknesses are and ha not not only how our content but how our instruction can really support them in that learning process and so one thing we do here at Edmentum is we have a ton of professional I'm actually in charge of the professional learning department and so our teachers go through all of the what a regular teacher in a brick and mortar would go through in terms of professional development we have special education um, teams here that sometimes work with some of our partner schools specifically that is one of the services we do provide and but those teachers also consult with our teachers on reading IEPs as well as we work really really closely with the site school SPED team or director um, making sure that we're we're meeting the accommodations and modifications and even more so being a partner in that student's education you know, as, as the instructional team we see things um, on a daily basis that may not be in the IEP or that have improved or need need some visibility to and so we work with those the site to make sure that we're supporting that student we have teachers that sit in on um, IEPs as a general education teacher and provide um, their feedback of how the student is doing with the families um, we have a really great partnership with our schools as well as the guardians and making sure that we are all having a really strong feedback loop to supporting the student so it's a really an environment where the students that are from special populations can thrive and not feel that anxiety and that pressure of I have to know it you know by now or else I'm going to be left behind or I don't I feel so um, insecure because maybe I don't feel like I'm you know at the same level of all of my classmates and I don't want to take risks and ask questions and I don't want to say when I don't know something and and the neat thing about virtual and personalized education is those students can be in an environment with just the teacher to to create um, those questions in that really safe place so that learning can continue to um, you know get to to go on so as well as our content has so many structures for special populations, whether, um, like Scott said, it be highlighters or translation or guided notes, or um, we have glossaries and vocabulary and dictionaries, all built within the actual learner management platform that is just an additional resource on top of our high quality instruction that we provide. Thank you. So I have a quick question. This is Naomi Shelton about um, how students themselves track their progress. Um, and so how, uh, what's the frequency advisors will meet with students? And then to what degree will students have um, the ability to monitor their own progress? Uh, 
Monique, do you want us to take this? Or do you guys start? Want to? I can start okay. and then you can, okay. you can jump in. So through the um, Maestro SIS and um, Plato, Plato courseware platform, whenever a student logs in, they see where they are every day. And so does their parent. So the students know if they're um, off pace, on pace, ahead of pace, they know their current grade based on the assignments that they've completed and they know what their grade would be at the end of the course if they did no more work. There is a pacing bar that lets them know where there should be, where they should be, and if they hover over that bar, um, it tells them what the, what the pacing goal is um, based on where they are in the course. So, um, we enroll the students in courses. They know our first day of school and they know the last day of the semester. And so they also anticipate, you know, general national holidays. And so they pace out the course according to the school calendar. And so students know where they are. Um, in terms of who they meet with, they meet with um, their teachers every week. Um, they also meet with um, me and, and now Mrs. Mrs. Thompson, who is the lead um, of the Friendship Collegiate Online Academy, um, more than once a week. Um, but we will be having, um, you know, Friday check-ins, Friday data review, um, so that uh, students know what it is they need to do to either get on pace or how to connect with their teacher to get um, the additional help that they need. Um, and they will also have, um, they will also be meeting with the um, collegiate ninth grade um, guidance counselor as well. Thank you. And I don't know if Kelly, if you were gonna add to that. Yeah, no, um, Monique really just really summed it up for us. I think one one piece that's important from our vantage point is we really encourage student advocacy and that they really understand how the system works and that they're very clear that we have orientation within our platform. And then we work really close with friendship and ensuring that all parties, all stakeholders are understand the systems and understand, you know, what they do with them and how they can understand the pacing. But we also are always looking at ways that we can improve that process and that communication piece as well from a company standpoint. And so I can say that we're really excited about a, a few new features coming out. And one of them is even a um, career path that will be launched this summer. And what that does is that allows for the students to see a calendar view of all of their assignments and what days ideally based on their start date and their end date, when they should have those assignments turned in. And so it's just kind of a more of a global look for them versus a daily look. They can see each day and they can see each week and they know if they didn't get those assignments done on by that day, it certainly doesn't mean that they're behind in the sense that they can't get to the finish line. It just means, okay, I know if I didn't do this this day, it rolls over into the next day. And it's just going to be another really great way for kids to self-pace and understand what they should be getting done on a daily, weekly, monthly um, semester basis. So we're very excited about that additional piece that'll be launched. And, and one other thing that I would like to add is that um, within the system, students can run reports. So, you know, daily, weekly progress reports that break down all of the assignments in that course, those, those tasks that they've attempted, those they haven't, how many times they've attempted the, um, the task, um, how much time they've spent on the task and we use those reports, especially when we're meeting with parents, you know, if there um, are concerns about their pacing, um, you know, having a conversation of whether they've spent either too much time, what's happening around that, or too little time. Um, and so those are great uh, tools as part of the platform that both students and their parents, their learning coaches have access to on a daily basis. And this is Scott Lobdell again. I just also just a quick add to that. This is available to them 24 seven. So, you know, if you have especially, you know, a student who's a night owl and wants to get some work done at one o'clock in the morning, they can go in and do that. Uh, and their progress is always there. But the same thing for the parents, 24 seven access, parents have their own login. Um, they can actually uh, view it on any, um, any piece of hardware 
that uh, actually gets internet access. So uh, we, we want parents and we want students to always have that, that ability. Are the teachers available 24 seven? No, <laughs> but um, you know, they, they are um, available uh, throughout, the, throughout the day um, the, and even into the evenings because teachers will actually have their own office hours and, and uh, work with the students on the, that communication. But we also provide beyond that on-demand help uh, for them and uh, on-demand help is uh, Monday through Friday. And if their regular teacher is not available, they can actually click on to a Zoom uh, link and they are in a session with a area expert that can help them with whatever material uh, that they need help with right now. I might also add too that because they're a friendship student, they also participate in the administration of our uh, NWA map assessments. Uh, as well as uh, the SRI at the high school. So um, students are able to kind of monitor their progress or completion uh, or uh, towards uh, their, their benchmark uh, utilizing the map as well. And we were fairly intentional about that design when we thought about that and we, and we thought about what the high school would look like and we worked with our families to uh, kind of uh, think about that design. We knew that there would be a, a day that we know that the students would need or would want, I shouldn't say need, but want uh, academic support. But we also knew that we needed to focus another day uh, around uh, kind of like an advisory for those students. So just like our uh, high school students uh, at Collegiate and also Tech Prep uh, participate in advisory, our online students also have advisory. So currently, uh, prior to the pandemic, um, those were on Thursday. So that was another opportunity for uh, our instructors, uh, Lauren, who's the high school administrator for the, administrator for the academy, uh, to sit with kids and work with kids and review their data uh, and review their uh, information to make sure that they were um, academically uh, moving forward. Any other questions? So I'll just have one, one last final question then. Um, if, uh, if we approve this, we'll be voting on this in July and this, as I understand it, will take effect starting with the new school year. Um, do you anticipate or how do you anticipate um, getting families and students knowledgeable about what this means for them in the next several months as they start uh, back up in the new school year? So I'll start. Um, if, if approved, um, we will be screaming from the rafters. No, we will um, send out um, a communication to our parents via um, via email. We also will have um, sort of like an opening uh, kickoff session before the start of school because we have to meet with students um, to plan their schedules for the upcoming year. So um, there will be a broad announcement um, and then there will be um, individual meetings that we will have with students as we work um, to devise their, um, their schedules. And so we will look at you know, all available data, um, talk to students about um, the graduation requirements that they have to meet and then those courses of interest that they may have. So, and I would want to add on to that, so hope when approved, uh, as, as part of our um, ongoing communications with families uh, and uh, constantly seeking feedback, especially during this time, um, Friendship right now is in the process of a lot of strategic planning. And one of the things that we do uh, throughout the week is we also have um, communications tools uh, specifically around learning without limits. So this would allow us to, you know, communicate that process. It would allow us uh, during our town hall meetings with schools and with families to communicate it uh, via that process. Uh, I'm quite sure that Dr. Jones uh, will have uh, that as part of, uh, of her orientation uh, with students, uh, particularly around those students who might be interested in singleton classes. Uh, but know that it'll be baked into our ongoing communication as we're constantly seeking feedback uh, from our stakeholders uh, over the summer as we plan for reopening friendships. So uh, know that it'll be part of that process. Hi, this is Peggy Jones. And just to add on to um, Mr. Cherry, um, one thing that we've done very well since um, transitioning to virtual learning is our communication. And so we've been having ongoing town halls with our parents and our, our scholars. 
And um, they've been well attended, even more attended than some of the events that we've had at the school. And so this would be something that we would continue to communicate with our students and our families. Um, and that we are sure if this is approved that um, our students as well as many of our parents would be really excited about having this opportunity. Yep. So Rick, just know that, you know, we're constantly talking with our students and families as we gather the information uh, on their um, preferred learning options for fall. So uh, again, it'll be baked into those conversations as, as we work with families as they think about um, which options they prefer. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I don't think any other questions at this point. I appreciate you all coming out this evening and the Edmentum team. And uh, again, this will be up for vote at next month's meeting. Very nice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Melody, I think you have one last item on the uh, public hearing agenda. Yes. Um, this is a public hearing to discuss Kingsman Academy Public Charter Schools request to opt for competency-based learning units beginning in school year 2021 to its ninth through 12th grade students. The school says adopting competency-based learning units will create fl greater flexibility for its students, which will, which will result in increased course completion and by extension, increased graduation rates. The school believes this will be especially beneficial for its overage, undercredited students who are not graduating at the same rate as their peers at other DC schools. According to the proposal, all of the high school's courses would be competency-based using Marziano Resources Personalized Competency-Based Education, or PCBE, framework. The school has been using the PCBE framework since school year 16-17, but because it has been implementing a competency-based framework in a Carnegie unit environment, the school has not been fully able to implement the framework in a way that maximizes student learning and success. Representatives from the school are available this evening to answer the board's questions. Kingsman team, if you wanna introduce yourself and if you have any, any opening remarks. Sure. Good evening, DC PCSB board and staff. My name is Shannon Hodge, and I'm co-founder and executive director of Kingsman Academy Public Charter School. On behalf of the students, families, staff, board, and partners of Kingsman Academy, I thank you for the opportunity to discuss our competency-based learning application with you this evening. I am joined by several other members of the Kingsman Academy team and a couple of partners who will introduce themselves in a few minutes. At the end of this month, I'll be transitioning from my role as Executive Director of Kingsman Academy. So if you'll indulge me a bit, I'd like to share my perspective on how we arrived at this application. In the months and years that preceded Kingsman Academy's opening, the city dealt with serious questions about whether and how charter schools could serve students who are Kingsman Academy's target population. Students who are overaged and undercredited, students who have attendance and truancy issues, and students who have emotional and behavioral challenges. I believed then and I believe now that both sectors should be evaluated in part on how we educate these specific students. When the Kingsman Academy founding team applied for a charter in 2014, we did so with the understanding that the road ahead of us would be difficult, but we had no idea what we were facing. We quickly realized that the school we planned on paper would not work for the students who walked into the building. Our academic program, our physical space, our accountability goals, and our staffing structure all felt innovative when we applied, but soon proved to be poor fits for our students. So as an entire school community, we set about redesigning the school to be what our students needed. Co-founder and Deputy Director Kenesha Kelly led this work. Over multiple years, she redesigned the school from the ground up, bringing in evidence-based research strategies from inside and outside of education to rebuild Kingsman Academy around the students we serve. Redesign learning spaces, restorative practices, project-based learning, customized technology platforms, personalized competency-based education. These are all ideas that she made come to life at Kingsman Academy to better serve our students. One additional piece of our puzzle will come together once we are able to move to competency-based learning credits. As explained in the application before you, the traditional Carnegie unit time-based credit earning system assumes students learn at the same pace and can serve to punish those who learn differently. As a result, it serves as a barrier to credit earning and high school completion for students most at risk of dropping out, the very students we serve. Six years ago, we could not have proposed the Kingsman Academy that we now know we need to be. The alternative accountability framework didn't exist. 
the alternative school star framework didn't exist. Competency-based learning had not yet reached the District of Columbia. What Kingsman Academy is becoming is, to me, evidence of the innovation and opportunity that charter schools can provide to improve the learning of all students, especially those who have struggled the most to find success in school. We as a city have a long way to go, but there are examples throughout the city of how non-traditional schools can and do serve all students well. I'm sure that you have questions about the application and Deputy Director Kenesha Kelly is here to answer them along with several of the partners she has worked with to redesign Kingsman Academy over the past few years. Before I turn this over to Ms. Kelly for her opening remarks, I would like to conclude by thanking you for your consideration of this application and your willingness over the past few years to put in the work to understand what we as a non-traditional school are trying to do and what you as an authorizer can do to help us better serve our students. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kenesha Kelly, co-founder and deputy director of Kingsman Academy Public Charter School. Our proposed competency-based academic program is an evidence-based alternative to a traditional Carnegie unit credit earning system. In a Carnegie-based credit earning system, the goal is for all students to progress through course content on pace with their age and grade level cohorts. Because the system is time-based, students are expected to move through course content at a standardized pace, even if the student knows the material and is ready to move ahead, or if the student does not fully understand concepts and skills and needs additional time to learn the material. Within our proposed competency-based credit earning system, time is not the driving factor in whether students are on credits. Instead, the focus is on whether a student has demonstrated proficiency on critical course concepts at each phase of post-secondary readiness and is ready to move on to the next level. Students have multiple opportunities and ways to demonstrate proficiency. Students have voice and choice in teaching and the learning process. More importantly, the proposed academic program allows Kingsman Academy to create multiple pathways to graduation and post-secondary readiness with real-time progress monitoring along the way. While teachers can be creative and innovative in how to teach students, and meet the needs of students within the framework, Kingsman Academy has direct access to a team of national experts and a partnership with Marzano Academies to make sure the school remains consistent in what is taught, how competency-based units will be earned, and how students will demonstrate competency in courses. Transitioning away from a Carnegie system will provide Kingsman Academy the flexibility in the ways that a student can earn credit and allow students to work on skills, content, and knowledge at their current level and individualized pace, regardless of their age, academic history, prior academic performance, or disability status. The proposed charter amendment will allow Kingsman Academy to implement our academic model with fidelity and better respond to the identified needs of our targeted population. We have with us today, Doug Finn, our competency-based program implementation specialist with Marzano Academies, Dr. Jody Ernst, Vice President of Research and Policy Analytics with Momentum Strategy and Research, and Steve Mesner, our Board Chair for Kingsman Academy. We're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, thank you everyone. I'm gonna open up for questions in a second. I just wanted to start off by um, thanking the Kingsman team for all of its work over the, over the last several years, and I know in many ways what you're asking us uh, tonight. Um, is a culmination of that. Um, I also wanted to uh, recognize Ms. Hodge, your leadership at the school and congratulate you on the new role at the DC Charter School Alliance. So um, lots of change, but I also know this is a, a big moment for, for Kingsman. Thank you. Board members, questions? <clears throat> Hi, this is Jim Sandman. I wanna echo Rick's thanks. I uh, visited the school last December and was very impressed and I, I want to give a special shout out to Shannon uh, for all she done, she's done in getting the, the school in such a wonderful position. I'm curious about your uh, relationship with Marzano. Can you tell us more about your, your partnership, how you selected um, Marzano to be your partner in this venture? Uh, sure, I can talk about the selection process and I'll have Doug Finn talk more about the work that he'll be providing uh, to Kingsman. Um, to, to Shannon's earlier point, we spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how do we design an academic program to meet the needs of our students. Uh, we engaged in a pretty robust strategic planning process where we 
interview uh, students, uh, staff, and families. Um, we collected survey data. We analyzed um, historical academic data. It really talked to our students about what they needed in an academic program. Um, once we had a good sense of what we needed, uh, we, sp we spent quite a bit of time doing research to identify sort of the best framework that we could use to implement our program. Um, and we reached out to Marzano uh, Research just to engage them in our ideas. And that initial conversation um, really led us to, to realize that the alignment um, in terms of the values of uh, Marzano Academies, um, and at the time Marzano Resources, uh, it was in direct alignment to what we needed to provide to our students and our families. Um, and it was just the basic components that we were trying to solve for as a school. So how do we engage students uh, who, who may not adhere to, to sort of these traditional norms around school engagement? Um, how do we make sure that we have a learning management system to track student progress along the way? Um, how do we, we identify critical course content um, that students need in, in order to progress? And then within that, how do we make sure we have a system in place, not just for accountability, but make sure our staff receive the training that they, they needed? Um, there are a lot of frameworks that are out there around competency-based, uh, but Marzano Research has been doing this work uh, for years, and they, they've really laid the foundation for what it needs to look like if a student, if a school implements a competency-based model well. Uh, and they really check the boxes off in terms of, in, in terms of what we were looking for. Um, Doug, do you want to add more to the Marzano Academies and what you guys will be providing for us? Uh, the nature of the relationship, you know, started as a um, kind of a very sh um, entry level uh, support uh, to go into and the, the amount that um, Kingsman Academy has taken the ideas and as you said, kind of that core um, understanding of what education is, has really developed them into a wonderful merger uh, between what our ultimate goal is for education um, and what Kingsman Academy's goal is for their students. Dr. Marzano um, has, I guess he likes to joke uh, in the later part of his career, uh, he is in now, he's bringing it all together, culminating all of the research he's done over the 40 plus years to bring it into a cohesive system instead of just fragments of research that's out there. And so um, just talking with Kanisha over the past couple of weeks, uh, moving towards this year coming forward, we're almost lockstep in our thinking of what needs to be done for our students. So we're very confident and comfortable with the relationship we have them with them. And uh, it feels just uh, almost like um, a friendship uh, that we're working with. So we're very uh, encouraged to work with Kingsman uh, throughout this upcoming years. Thank you. Thank you for all of this. And I, I also want to echo the gratitude um, expressed by my colleagues, Rick and Jim already uh, for you, Shannon. Um, I wanted to ask, based, what have you learned from the, the PCBE um, implementation over the last few years that has informed how you plan to implement the use of this going forward? Should we approve it? Uh, we, we've learned a lot. Um, I think the first thing was to, to start slow, um, slow and steady wins the race, but have very clear objectives in terms of benchmarks along the way. Um, I think there are multiple ways that a school can jump into a competency-based program. Uh, we definitely took the more strategic approach uh, by making sure that um, we were collaborating and communicating with our students and families. Uh, the, first, the first thing we did after um, the research that we did internally and then reaching out to Marzano Resources uh, was to uh, adopt a standards reference report card. Um, that was really the first sort of um, communication that, that we had with our families that were headed, headed in the right direction. Uh, what that did was it took away um, sort of this pressure of a student trying to get an A, um, although they, may, they didn't know the content uh, at the pace that, that they that, that they were expected to know it at. Uh, so for example, um, we were able to communicate to students and say, you know, your, your proficiency scale, or we're gonna measure um, your content based on a zero to four scale, not an A, B, C, D, or F scale. Uh, it made our students um, motivated and inspired not to give up when they encounter course content that they didn't know. Um, and once we heard students talk about the scale in the sense that, you know, I have a two, what does it take for me to get a three? What do I need to know? What do I need to learn? Um, I didn't do a, a good job the first time, but I'm practicing and I want to get better. 
we knew where we were on the right track. Um, the fact that we could put that scale on a report card meant that we had a, a, a tool to communicate to our families about the direction that we were headed in, uh, headed in with the school. Um, the fact that we were able to kind of gradually introduce this to our school community meant that we were able to learn a new learning management system um, so that we could personalize course content for students. We had to teach our teachers how to use the system, but we also had to teach our students. I um, mean, we took our time in order to get, get to that space. Uh, the other component that was extremely important uh, is that Doug came in when we started the relationship and the partnership uh, to provide our teachers with professional development. Um, so we're, we're three years in at this point and they're not hearing anything for the first time. They're ready to just implement fully with fidelity, um, but professional development was definitely a barrier in the beginning. Uh, we were not expecting them to learn everything in one year, but over time they've been able to learn the framework, learn the model, practice the model, and then help their peers and support their peers when new staff came on board. Thank you, that's helpful, it makes sense. I wanted to ask just a little bit about how Kingsman has been experiencing and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And just looking ahead, um, if you go forward with a competency-based learning program, what type of adjustments might you expect um, if the school should need to be remote or um, partially remote in the fall? Sure, um, I'll start and then I'll let uh, Shannon chime in. Um, when, when, we, when we knew that we had to, to kind of prepare for COVID-19, we really focused on prim five primary areas uh, to implement our distance learning plan. Um, the first was individualized academic engagement. We knew we had a, a learning framework that was designed to support our students anytime, anywhere, um, and that that content was already personalized for their needs, uh, regardless of their disability status or how many grade levels they were behind, that they were able to access content that fit them and, and the instructional resources were aligned to their needs as well. Um, we also designed a master schedule uh, that, that was aligned to our multi-tier system of support system. Um, so students were grouped into cohorts uh, through distance learning um, so that teaching teams and support staff could push in to support students uh, as they were learning or, or receiving live instruction, but also support them if they needed one-on-one -on -one support. The second area was targeted interventions and supports. Uh, quite of our students require intensive behavioral um, and interventions. So we assigned behavior support staff, so intervention specialists, behavior interventionists, um, to engage with a very small group of students so that everyone in the building had someone that they could go to. Um, but we also didn't want to put such a burden on our staff that they were not able to respond to the needs and navigate their own sort of COVID-19 uh, challenges. Um, we had a uh, morning check-in, uh, community meetings with students, uh, check-in, small group um, instruction. Um, the third was making sure that our students with IEPs and special needs had their specifically designed instructional plans and programs in place. Uh, we coordinated student support services, so every single student had a Chromebook and a hotspot. Um, we knew that that would be important. Um, and then we made sure that our students had uh, food each week. Um, and then the, the, the last piece was, how do we support our, our students and our families in, with technology and access to technology? Um, so we held virtual office hours. Uh, students were, were trained to provide peer-to-peer -peer support for our management systems. Um, and then the, the one thing that I think we were most excited about is that our PBIS system has been customized for Kingsman. And it's also an anytime, uh, anywhere PBIS system that's individualized for students. So we were able to keep them motivated as they hit certain benchmarks along the way. Um, Shannon, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just, just a couple of things. I think the, the main thing for us was, for us, what we call the virtual school didn't really feel too different from our regular school programming. Um, the systems that students were using with the exception of the video conferencing software were ones that they were already familiar with. Um, so once we provided hotspots to all of the students with internet access and Chromebooks, we were able to roll out virtual school pretty seamlessly. Um, the other thing I think is also for us, the reason it didn't feel different is because our general approach to how we're doing school with our students is to make sure their needs are met before we jump into the learning. Um, and so some places you'll see that as Maslow before Bloom. I think that's certainly true for our students. I often tell people that for our students, the first question they get asked in the morning can't be, did you do your math homework, right? It may need to be, did you eat last night? Um, did you have a place to sleep? Do you need a shower? 
Um, and so in many, for, for many of our students, those same kind of stressors happened with COVID-19. And so for us, it felt kind of, you know, par for the course for us to check on their needs first before we jumped into the learning. Um, and so that certainly helped with the virtual school. Um, I'll let Kanisha talk about kind of what would need to change for next year if we are uh, partially or are fully uh, virtual next year. Um, I think the biggest challenge we had and what we'll have to improve on for next year is that for students who required intensive behavioral interventions, um, they, they were not, um, they were less likely to initial engage in distance learning to the point that Shannon just talked about. The way our school is designed, we have what we call priority areas. Um, and there are areas beyond academics where we have to make sure those needs are met first before we get to some of the more, you know, traditional school academic priority areas. So those areas are um, behavior support services, um, health and wellness in light of COVID-19, um, and student engagement, and then academics. Once we identify a student's uh, priority area, we implement evidence-based practices to make sure that we're responding to their needs, but we're doing it in, in a way that's helpful um, and that's sustainable over time. Um, I think as we think about uh, the upcoming school year, um, we know that quite a few of our students are already um, behind in credit, so they're going to require credit recovery. Uh, we know that uh, our middle school students in particular are ready to get in, inside the building um, and socialize. Uh, so what we're doing right now is reaching out to our individual students and families to learn about what their needs are and make sure that our plan for the upcoming school year aligns to their needs, but also to the public health guidelines. Great. Thank you for your intense student support and focus. Just one other question. Do you have a sense of what percentage of your students were engaged um, in, from March through June? Yeah, if we look across each priority area, I think we have uh, about uh, 10 students um, in our daytime program who, who were uh, disengaged. Um, once we tried to dig into the information a little bit more, um, most of those issues were related to uh, just life circumstances um, and what we would just call in public health so social determinants of health. Um, and they, they had to focus on, on those areas of life um, and academics wasn't the priority. The great thing about a competency-based framework is that um, we, we start with that student wherever they left off. So it, it, it's not like they miss content that they, they're falling behind. Um, if they're disengaged, we are right here waiting for them um, and ready to move them along in their content uh, once we get them back engaged in school. Um, we have an amazing support team at Kingsman Academy. Uh, we have a community-based social worker. Uh, we have intervention support staff uh, who are really on the ground making sure that our kids have what they need. Um, it, it just may not be academics. And I think that's the one lesson we definitely learned in COVID-19. Um, but it was also the one thing that we've been trying to solve for since we've been open. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? <coughs> um, Mr. Messner, since you are on the, uh, the uh, line tonight, I'd be remiss not to ask uh, what the process is in place uh, to find a new head of Kingsman Academy. Uh, we, the board at the last board meeting, uh, uh, chose um, to select uh, Ms. Kelly as our next um, ED. She's uh, well qualified, experienced. She's perfect for the role. Excellent. Well, I was not. I was not expecting such a, a quick answer. Congratulations, Kanisha. Thank you. <laughs> you got lots of of hands hands waving and uh, <laughs> thank you. All right. Any other questions at this time? Otherwise, uh, we will be coming back to vote on this in July. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kingsman team. Thank you, Marzano team. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. All right, um, public hearing is over. We're actually gonna start the meeting now. Um, so as usual, uh, we, I need a motion to approve the agenda and then I am going to do a roll vote. I move to approve the June 22nd, 2020 board meeting agenda. All right, 
Second. Uh, second. We got a motion and a second. All right. Um, going to get a roll call vote. Uh, Ricardo Gangem. Aye. James Sandman. Aye. Naomi Shelton. Aye. Bob Bureta. Aye. Steve Bumbo. Aye. Leah Crusey. Aye. And Rick Cruz is an aye. A motion passes to approve the agenda. And our discussion item this evening, and Scott, I believe you're presenting it, is our financial analysis report for fiscal year 2019. Yes, um, thank you, Rick. Um, I am very pleased to present our financial analysis review, or FAR, for fiscal year 2019. Um, I'll just make a brief introduction, and then if people have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We have been releasing the FAR since 2012, um, and at a time when there are widespread calls for maximum transparency, uh, the FAR provides an extraordinary collection of financial information about each of DC's public charter schools. I am not aware of any jurisdiction in the country that provides more financial information about its schools than we do here in Washington. The purpose of the FAR is to summarize and expand on the annual financial audit that each charter school undergoes every year. So a charter school, like any uh, company and like any nonprofit organization, um, goes through an audit by a certified financial accountant. And the audits for the school year that ended in June of 2019 were completed by all the schools by November of 2019 and then submitted to PCSB. And as soon as we receive the audits, we release them to the public. So those are available on our webpage. And then we started work on the FAR report, which we're releasing tonight. So I'd like to take a few minutes to describe what information the FAR contains. So first of all, on pages five through eight, are data tables that add up all of the financial results of all of the public charter schools and present them as a single set of hypothetical financial statements for the whole sector. So you can see what was the total revenues for the entire charter sector, for example, or the total expenditures. Um, and this allows us to see some interesting patterns. For example, you can see that overall, public charter schools received $143 million of facilities funding, but you can also see that they spent a total of $167 million on occupancy expenses. The tables that follow on pages nine through 22 provide key information for each school, allowing for easy comparison across all charter schools. For example, on pages 19 and 20, we show how much philanthropic revenue each charter school has received, both overall and per pupil, over the last three years. And so by looking over those tables on pages 19 and 20, you can see that some schools received no, finance, no philanthropic revenue at all, and others received millions of dollars, many tens of thousands of dollars per pupil. Beginning on page 29 are the individual reports on each charter LEA. And each report is two pages long. The first page shows how the school does along key metrics of financial health. And we show this visually so you can see if the school's in the green zone or the red zone. And we compare it with how um, the school did the year before and how they do relative to the charter average. So you can see at a glance the financial health of the school. And the second page of the report provides key financial information like total revenues and total expenses. It also shows how the school's expenses break down by category and how those compare with the charter average. So you can see if a school spends more than average on occupancy or less than average on personnel expenses. And then it also contains notes. So if we, if, if our analysis of the school's financials reveals something we think is important, we, we discuss that in the notes about the school. And when a school works with a management company, we also include a third page on the report, 
where we describe the amount of money that the school pays for the man in the management fee. And we also provide other key information about the management company, such as the top salary of the head of the management company. Um, overall, through the history of the FAR, we have seen the overall financial health of the charter sector improve. And this is not an abstract thing because when a disruption happens like COVID, we can have confidence that our schools have the resources to meet student needs, whether that means buying thousands of devices or hotspots for their students, or being able to face enrollment uncertainties without being worried about their financial stability. And I'll just close by saying that the FAR report is just one of many releases that we make every year around school financials. This includes schools budgets, their annual tax returns, information on teacher salaries, and data on every procurement the school makes that exceeds $25,000. I would add that um, in the last year, we have made that procurement database searchable. So you can go on and search for any particular vendor or look at all the procurements that a school's made over the years and see that. We're very proud of the transparency that we brought to charter school financials, and we encourage the public to scrutinize this report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Board members, any comments or questions on with regard to the uh, FAR report? Uh, this is Jim Sandman. Thank you for uh, the report, Scott, and especially for your summary. You said that over time, the financial health of the sector has improved. I'm curious how this report relates to similar reports over the last few years. This found that 73% of total LEAs meet or exceed the standards on the six key indicators. What has that figure been in recent years? What is the trend line over the past few years? The trend line over the last few years has been that a higher and higher percentage have met financial indicators. It's not a perfectly smooth trend line because over the years we have raised the bar of what it takes to meet that. So for example, we used to um, say that having 30 days of cash on hand was acceptable. Now we say that's 45 days. Um, it's also important that, you know, this is just a first step at a snapshot. So for example, you may see a school that didn't meet one of the indicators, meaning, for example, maybe they spent more money last year than they took in as revenue. Well, if a school has a lot of money saved and it has a plan for why it's spending more money that year, perhaps they're investing in new curriculum or they're investing in um, new computers or things like that, that may not be a bad thing. It's a flag for us to look at and see whether it indicates that there's a problem, but just because a school doesn't meet one or more indicators doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, operating in a financially irresponsible or poor way. Um, certainly if a school has missed six or seven, um, you know, of the indicator, six or five or maybe even four, we might be really concerned, but any school that's missed um, more than one we look at, uh, and only a few of the schools were schools where we really needed to take a close look. And in those cases, we, we work very closely with the school um, to make sure that they are on a path to becoming financially stronger. Thank you. Scott, just to follow up on that, um, kind of looking toward the future with the impacts of COVID-19, do you have any thoughts on how this might impact schools finances going into next year? Uh, yes, I have a few. I mean, first of all, the good news is that what we were all fearing, which was that the large shortfall in revenue that the city is facing because of the decline in sales taxes and hotel taxes and things like that. We were all afraid that that would translate into large reductions in per pupil funding by the city. Um, and that didn't come to pass. We were overjoyed that the mayor was really able to pull a rabbit out of a hat and through a combination of 
rainy day funds and, um, and, and federal financing um, and just really tight financial management in a lot of, a lot of other areas, whether it's like controlling travel expenses across the city, um, she was able to find sufficient revenues that in fact, the per pupil funding for schools is actually gonna go up next year by 3%. So, um, and in addition to that, there was um, uh, in the CARES Act, the federal act that uh, appropriated over $3 trillion for coronavirus relief, there was specific funding for Title I schools and most of our schools are Title I schools. And so they will be receiving uh, over $20 million of extra funding through that. So I think on the whole, um, the schools should be in good shape. The, the big unknown really is enrollment. Um, you know, there's some, uh, you know, charter schools are citywide schools and a significant percentage of students take public transportation to get to school. So what we don't know is whether large numbers of families may elect to not continue it at their charter school and maybe go to their neighborhood school where they're able to walk, for example. Um, and so, you know, it's possible that schools, if that comes to pass, it, and we really don't know, um, you know, could face big drops in enrollment. And, and that would be precisely the kind of thing that, you know, a school that had a healthy balance sheet, strong financials could get through. Um, yes, their assets would go down, they'd spend some of their cash, they might have to borrow against their assets, but they could weather that storm. Um, and I, I, I want to emphasize, we don't know what's going to happen with enrollment. Um, we will learn more over the summer. We're getting some reports in the next week from my school, D.C., about how enrollment looks and we'll be hearing from schools. Um, I haven't heard anything yet that indicates a calamitous outcome, but um, I think it's still too early to tell because we don't really know the full path of this pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Sure. Scott, I, I believe I know the answer to this question, but this is um, the FAR, or the Financial Analysis Report, is um, based on data that is already publicly available. All of the sources are publicly available um, on our website, on, on yes. uh, schools' websites. It's based on data that is available on our website. So um, if you go to our transparency hub and go to the, the financial section, you can see the audit, the financial audit that the school had done. Um, and this was, would, this is the audit for the fiscal year that ended June 30th, 2019. Now we do some calculations. So we'll present, for example, days of cash that the school has. Um, that's not something you might find written in their audit. You can calculate it using the data that the school provides, but in the FAR, we try to um, provide a little extra analysis so that the public can see at a glance um, how financially healthy the school is. Thank you. Board members, any other questions or comments on the financial analysis report? Just gratitude for this. This is a really, this has been an important tool. It's been, um, I think it sets an example for um, authorizers elsewhere and other public sector bodies. Um, and it's useful for schools individually, for researchers, for, for us to be able to make decisions. So this is just one of many examples of ways in which you've contributed to the sector here in DC. Thanks. Leah. Um, just a quick question in terms of this, the schools where they did not meet the expectation um, or the measures outlined for that 27% um, of the schools, what do we have any cause for concern? What are we doing in terms of um, working with those schools? And do we anticipate COVID having more adverse uh, effects on their financial standing? Um, great, great question. I have a list of all of the schools in front of me, and 
Um, I would say at this point, there is not a single school that I have significant concerns about. Um, there are a couple of the schools that were on that list are schools that closed at the end of 2019, schools like City Arts and Ideal and Democracy Prep. Um, there are um, a few schools that had um, some weak financials but have worked very hard um, over the last year to strengthen their financials. And we've seen that because we see the school's interim, interim data. Um, uh, a couple of the schools were brand new schools and often, you know, when a school starts, they don't have any accumulated reserves, but we've seen the work that they've done to build their reserves over the last year um, and also to attract philanthropy. Um, so, um, you know, there, there, you know, we, we, a couple of years ago when uh, Cesar Chavez Public Charter School was before us, we, we, knew that they had a long-term financial uh, challenge. Um, they have a lot of cash, they're losing money every year, and their challenge is to get their enrollment up and re um, and uh, essentially recapitalize their loan at a lower interest rate um, before they run out of cash. And they still have a couple more years, so we're tracking that. Um, and um, they're confident that they they will be able to do that. So that's something that's on the horizon that we're a little concerned about. Uh, one of the schools that came up on on some of the lists was Latin America Montessori Bilingual. They had a big loan that was coming due. Since um, since then, they have refinanced that loan. They've sold their school building on Missouri Avenue, and they're consolidating over at at the Kingsbury building. So. Um, uh, there's another school that has meet, met, missed a couple of them, and that's Rocket Ship. Um, and that's because they, they have a big debt, but the debt is to Big Rocket Ship. And Big Rocket Ship has made, made it clear that, you know, the school isn't expected to pay that back until they have the capability of doing so. So it's different than having debt, you know, to a bank or something like that. Um, so uh, at this point, um, you know, um, a school that's not on the list for anything, but that I have some concerns about depending on the path of COVID is Monument Academy. Um, Monument depends on, and, and SEED for that matter, those schools depend on boarding, boarding level revenues per pupil, you know, per pupil revenues at the level of $40,000 per pupil or more. And if, if for some reason they were unable to run a boarding program, um, that that could be quite serious for them. At this point, it doesn't look like that's going to be an issue, but we're still in June and we don't know how the pandemic is going to progress. Thanks for that, Scott. All right. If there aren't any other questions on that, I'm going to turn to our consent calendar. And Melody, I believe you had one update you wanted to bring our attention to before we vote on the consent calendar. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. During our June public meeting, we incorrectly reported that the Children's Guild Public Charter School proposed removing its student Gallup poll goals. The school did not actually request removing these goals. And we've since corrected the proposal and the charter agreement amendment to retain the sort of Gallup poll goals. Um, so tonight we'll be asking you to approve the goals um, in the corrected amendment. And those are the, uh, and that has been corrected on the public record and the materials for tonight's meeting. Correct. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Melody. Thank you. All right, uh, consent calendar. Um, would anyone, any member of the board like to remove an item from the calendar for further discussion or state a recusal on any item in the record? I would like to recuse myself from the item that includes youth build. All right, so I'm gonna pull you out of youth build. All right, so then um, I'm gonna take that out of the uh, consent calendar and if there aren't, Sorry, Rick, I think um, take me out of the one for inspired teaching. Okay. All right, so youth build and inspired teaching removed from the consent calendar. 
Uh, we'll do separate. Uh, should we? We'll do separate votes on those um, for the uh, consent calendar minus youth build and inspired teaching. Um, can I get a motion? And again, okay, yes. Can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve all items on the consent calendar except for the two that we'll handle separately. Second. The motion and a second. Um, I will do a roll call vote again. Uh, Jim Salmon. Aye. Naomi Shelton. Aye. Bob Breda. Aye. Bumba. Aye. Leah Crusey. Aye. Ricardo Gangem. Aye. And this is Rick Cruz, aye. Okay, so the motion passes for the consent calendar. Then we have two items we've pulled, uh, the youth build. Um, let's get this right. Youth build charter renewal agreement. Um, can I get a motion to approve the charter renewal agreement for youth build DC PCS? I move to approve the charter amendment agreement for youth build public charter school. Get a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. All right. Um, and then I'll do a roll call as well. Jim Sandman. Aye. Naomi Shelton. Aye. Saba Breda. Aye. Bumbao. Aye. Ricardo Ganjam. Aye. Leah Crucy is recused and this recruits with an I, so that motion passes. Similarly then, can I get a, a motion on the charter amendment for Inspire Teaching Demonstration PCS, the year of PMF as goals update? I move to approve uh, Inspire Teaching Demonstration PCS um, update of the PMF as goals. Charter amendment? Amendment, yes, charter amendment, sorry. <laughs> second. I've got a motion and a second. Um, do a roll call vote. Jim Salmon? Aye. Naomi Shelton? Aye. Bubba Beretta is recused. Steve Bumbau? Aye. Leah Crucey? Aye. Ricardo Ganjam? Aye. Rick Cruz with an I, and that motion passes as well. All right. Any new business? You sure? All right. If there isn't, I will take a motion to adjourn to this evening's meeting. I move to adjourn the June 22nd, 2020 board meeting. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, roll call vote. Ricardo Ganjam? Aye. Mayor Crucey? Aye. Steve Bumbau? Aye. Baba Beretta? Aye. Naomi Shelton? Aye. Jim Sandman? Aye. And Rick Cruz with an aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have you. Have a good night. Take care.